board cam. Take one. I mean, take three. I should really stop doing this. Uh-oh. Good. This is me when I was 10 years old. Ever since I was a little girl, I always felt like my brain chemicals were off. Different, at least. I'm Vivian, I'm a Gemini, and I'm gonna talk about my good old ADHD. That's Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Not to be confused with ADD, which is outdated and just excludes hyperactivity. I wasn't diagnosed with ADHD until after I graduated high school, and the more I learned about it, the more I realized how it has and continues to impact my life. Because ADHD is such a broad term, it has been categorized into three different types. There is hyperactive type, inattentive type, and combined, which is most common and what I have. ADHD affects me in a variety of different ways, but like all people with ADHD, some are worse than others. Growing up, I was loud and abrasive but I never disrupted class and I never disrespected adults. I wasn't the typical hyperactive kid that normally gets a diagnosis. I was unfocused and under the radar. This is widely common for women with ADHD. It was all about little boys who couldn't sit still, couldn't shut up, and were driving everybody nuts. It was just behavior problems. Children with anxiety, depression, PTSD, or sleep disorders are the most common misdiagnosis. Since 1980, we've realized that this is not so much a behavior problem, but far more a problem with the brain's management system, its executive functions. While I check the boxes for most symptoms of ADHD, they all fall into three different categories. First, inattentiveness and memory. Like anybody else, they see and hear things that are going on around them. They have thoughts going through their head. But most people, if they have something they've got to focus on, can push that stuff out of the way and focus on what they've got to do. People with ADHD, it's real hard for them to do that. And somebody drops a pencil and they have to sort of check and see where did the pencil go. And then they'll be back on task again for a couple of minutes. And then they're thinking about some TV show they saw the night before. And then they're back on task again for a minute and they're thinking about some conversation they had with somebody two hours ago. And then they're back on task again for a few minutes. And then they're looking out the window like anybody else will from time to time, but they're likely to sit and watch the squirrel go up the tree a little longer than somebody else and be checking out the traffic and the cloud formation, the guy who's mowing the lawn. Then they're back on task again for a few minutes. And they'll be thinking about what they're going to do when this is over and how soon is this thing going to be over anyhow. I've got things I've got to do. And what am I going to have for supper tonight? And I wonder what's on TV tonight. It's almost like you're trying to watch TV and you've got four different stations all coming in at the same time at the same on one channel and it gets kind of hard to separate the signal from the noise. I am always forgetting what I'm doing. Just the other night, I needed to clean my glasses. But first I had to wash my hands because they were filthy. After I washed my hands, I went and sat back down on the couch. Was I supposed to do something? Unsure, I went to my room and looked around. Not remembering anything, I went back to the couch and sat down. I turned my head and ah, bingo, my glasses. I need to clean them. What a damn whirlwind. Emotional dysregulation. Aspects of my ADHD have and continue to make me feel inadequate. The reality is, is that ADHD makes emotions hit you 10 times harder than the average person. Now this is in parallel with what's known as emotional dysregulation. Inside the brain there's something called the limbic system, which controls the emotional regulation components such as the anterior cingulate cortex and the amygdala. In the ADHD brain, however, the anterior cingulate is usually around 3-5% to smaller and is far less active, which results in a decreased ability to inhibit and control emotion. So this may explain why rejection sensitive dysphoria would occur. So in a way ADHD has kind of programmed you to expect the worst and to take things more literally and more seriously. In fact it feels like a personal attack on who they are at their very core. It can just make you really blow things out of proportion. I hate myself when I can't get something done, but it's not my fault, but it is, I don't really know. Whether it's the hurt feelings or being annoyed about something, 
or I've got to have it now, or what would happen if comes and just sort of gobbles up all the space in their head. And it's very difficult for them to put it in perspective, to put it to the back of their mind and get on with what they've got to do. I was lucky enough to grow up in a place that was surrounded by nature. If I ever felt overwhelmed, I was able to retreat to the water, the flowers, and to peacefulness. Since moving to New York, my biggest struggle has been the lack of nature and the lack of peace. I live in the East Village, a cornerstone of the concrete jungle. While I love the constant hustle of the city, I still crave the nature I've grown up with, the nature that has grounded me. Another key element of ADHD is hyperfocus, which is exactly what it sounds like. Everybody I've ever seen who has ADHD has a few things they can do where they have no trouble paying attention. And if you ask them about it, they say, what's with this? How come you can do it here and you can't do it here, here, and here? Usually what they'll say is, it's easy. If it's something I'm interested in, I can pay attention. If not, I can't. One time I was doing some homework for class. I went onto my Adobe Creative Cloud and I saw a website designer. Hmm, I thought, this looks interesting. So I clicked and spent the next many hours designing my website just for fun. I rationed that I'll eventually need this so it's important that it's in good shape. When I finished, I was proud of what I had done. It was so easy. And then it all came crashing down when I saw the homework I had ignored. Hyperfocus also led me to crocheting. Once quarantine started in March, I tried all different creative mediums to keep myself busy. I tried painting, embroidery, puzzles, etc. Crocheting was the only thing that stuck with me. It was so easy, so time consuming, and so satisfying. I can crochet in conversations while I watch TV, when I walk around the house or during lectures. I became obsessed with it. Hyperfocus is a superpower that I can't really control. Life is a constant game of stimulation and interest. Ever since I was a kid, I was in a constant battle with my brain and the people around me. People told me to work harder, be motivated, and to just do it. While ADHD doesn't directly affect everyone, it is still essential to educate yourself about it. This goes for any mental illness. The best and only way to understand someone is to educate yourself on how their brain works. It requires time and patience, but I'd say it's worth the extra effort. Mental illness is a lot of work, but it does make someone uniquely special. Good, that's a wrap.